All right, ladies and gentlemen, before we get to our next episode, we have a voicemail from someone who was referred to in a voicemail from a wife on the Fred Goldsmith episode, which is referring back to the interview with Dr. Garish about Roman history. Let's listen to this voicemail now. Go Duke. Uh, Hey, my sister's hun. It's your best friend who evidently you've been referring to as a bit, a bit for years. This was news to me, but I guess it's news to everyone since you've put that out here for all the Bull City coordinator fans. So, uh, question for the pod. Et tu, Ben? Also, can we get to that from the, uh, the milk situation? All right. Kisses. Love you. Best friend. Bye. Well, that voicemail was nothing other than a complete waste of time. Once again, for the record, not my best friend. And new phone, who dis? Folks, please leave a message and you will get on the podcast. And I hope very much that you enjoy this next episode. As always, go Duke. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to... We're not going to call it the standard Bull City Coordinators Duke Football Coverage Podcast. Today is the Classical Antiquity Podcast brought to you by Bull City Coordinators, which means we are here to talk about what Edgar Allan Poe once referred to as the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. You know where to find us, bullcitycoordinators.com. Pretty much all the socials are at Duke FB Coverage. Send us an email, bullcitycoordinators at gmail.com. Call 540-632-0160. Leave a voicemail and you will get on the podcast. Now, as you all remember from our episode with Dr. Garish, in which we talked about ancient Rome and primarily Julius Caesar, I have been working to get other guests on the podcast to talk about Uh, classical antiquity and i have succeeded in that today and in response to my kids fondness for greek mythology as a result of percy jackson i'm excited to introduce our next guest to talk about greek antiquity greek mythology and religion our next guest is a professor in the classics and philosophy department at hollands university right here in the 540 area code and she specializes in ancient Greece, Greek mythology, and Greek religious practices, and the environmental impact uh, and environmental forces behind said myths and religious practices, which we will talk about some today. Dr. Christina Soloway, how are you? I'm great. Thank you, Ben, for having me on this podcast. This is a new experience for me, and I'm uh, looking forward to seeing how it all goes. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it, and I look forward to speaking with you today. I read the articles that you sent me. Those were very helpful and very interesting. As people know, when I have folks on the podcast, I like to get into their origin story as it relates Mm -hmm. to the topic that we're discussing. So why don't you tell us how you ended up getting into ancient Greece and also into your area of specialty? Yeah, it's um, there is. There are some really clear steps in how I got to where I am today. The first one was because Plainfield Public Schools in Plainfield, New Jersey, stopped teaching Latin to their students back when I was about to start high school, and this distressed me. I don't know where I got it in my head as a 12-year-old, that having Latin was the thing you needed to have to be educated. But I rode my bicycle around to all of the private schools in the area and asked them if they could take me in to learn Latin. And lo and behold, this resulted in a a scholarship to a wonderful all-girls school called the Hartridge School in Plainfield, New Jersey. And I had the great pleasure of having the best teacher in my whole life, Dr. Ethel Cook. And she taught me Latin. She also made it so that I could learn Greek um, when I was about 14 or 15 years old. 
And then I went on to college to double major in classics and chemistry. So the chemistry part is kind of important because that's what I went on to do. I got um, a master's degree in organic chemistry, and I've never regretted having that scientific background. Although I did go back to classics um, after I got my, after I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a while, it wasn't gelling with me. There were some problems. So I decided to go back and pick up a degree in classics. And it's that scientific background, I think, that made me look at the ancient past a little bit differently than other people might have looked at it. And that's what eventually led me to um, understanding that these myths were mapping the ancient Greek world, and we're referring very specifically to geomorphological um, aspects of the landscape of Greece, but encoding it in a storytelling way with monsters and fantastic heroes. And but it was ultimately about the control of the natural forces that beset humankind in trying to set up a way to live in the land they live in. So all of those things led me to where I am today. I'm really glad I did the science part. I'm really glad that Partridge School took me in and started teaching me Latin because the languages, the close analysis of language is so important to what I do, as well as looking at the scientific studies on some of the archaeological sites that are germane to the mythological stories I study. So that's how I got to where I am. <laughs> so with your background, did you take any classes or courses that led you in that direction? Or were you reading Greek mythology, looking at some history and trying to say, okay, how did this myth come about? Was it sort of detective work on your own part? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, um, when you train as a classicist, there's very specific skills you have to have, um, especially if you want to look broadly at the ancient world. The language skills are really important. Reading those things in translation means that you're accepting other people's interpretations of them. And you're a step away from the folks who wrote it, the word choices they made and how those word choices are full of meaning that are really important. So I first got those language skills down and then I started doing some training as an archeologist and realized that there are all sorts of new ways that people were looking at archeological sites, um, sort of, doing a real reading of the landscape rather than looking for stuff, for gold, for walls. But they were reading how people use the landscape in their everyday life. And so a lot of this was just done on my own. And I started to combine them on my own when I got to grad school. And in fact, this was not looked on favorably the 30 years ago I was in grad school, where you were supposed to be a philologist, you studied ancient stuff, uh, ancient languages, or you were supposed to be an art historian, you looked at uh, the aesthetics of ancient art, or you're supposed to be an archaeologist, you dug in the dirt. But I thought that all three of those things really should work together to give us a full picture of the ancient world. And so I was actually the first person in my graduate program to graduate with a degree in Greek, Latin, classical and Near Eastern art and archaeology. So I combined them all. It was a struggle. Um, but in the end, that's where we are in classics today. We realize that none of these disciplines can work separately, but they need to work together. And <clears throat> now departments have these, um, you know, they call them groups, where there's a lot of interdisciplinarity in the way you study the ancient world. But when I was coming up as a classicist, this was not looked upon as favorably as it is today. So I feel a little bit like I was a groundbreaker in doing that. And um, my 
articles are well received and it certainly helps in the teaching of classics because um, being broadly trained, you can bring all sorts of perspectives into the classroom and then engage the biologist who's in your art history class or engage the Spanish major who's in your Latin class. You know, so I think that interdisciplinarity is the name of the game now. It's interesting the way that you said that your initial approach wasn't looked upon fondly at the time when you started going down that road, because when we were emailing about doing this, you told me what your focus was and what you looked at. And I said, I'd never thought about it that for, not never thought about it that way before, but now that you say it, it makes perfect sense the way that the landscape would influence mythology and the myths that come about. And then it reminded me of the story that, and I'm mentioning this for the listeners specifically, but I took a religious history or comparative religions class at college and the professor was explaining what the story of Job was all about, which is trying to understand how good thing or how what we would consider good people or just or pious people, whatever term you want to use, still have terrible things happen to them. And I always found that interesting in the back of my mind, because whenever you would come across, you know, when you go to church or whatever, you'd wonder, okay, well, what, what, what are we really getting at? What's the story behind this? And so your approach to it seemed very logical and made just a ton of sense once somebody explained it, but of course, naturally, that would be frowned upon because it's it's new. I, I, I find I, I find that backstory very interesting. So, do you do you try to to merge it all together for your students when you're teaching them about this? Yeah, I um I teach a course that I love very much called the Environmental History of the Ancient World. And I think people think about like environmental history as being one thing only, but it's really a tripartite study. One is how does the land we live in shape how we live in it and who we are? And then the second aspect of it is how do we try to control or shape the landscape in order to live in it as human beings? And then the third thing is how do our writings, our history, our songs, our poetry, our art reflect attitudes towards the environment? And so this is sort of bringing all three of those things together. And I feel like in order to understand how we live in this incredible world we live in with a variety of bioscapes, really, um, we need to think about all of those things, especially in studying how people did it in the historical past. I mean, living in Appalachia is really a great place to be because you see that echoed in so many things around here, how the mountains have shaped the way people live in this area, what they eat, how they think, how they um, how they write songs and stories and myths. And that's what I try to do in Greece. That's why I have to be in Greece two months a year. And so, so I can really immerse myself in that landscape. And so I do that by teaching it to the students in the classroom. But then I also take students to Greece. And we witness all of those things and we use all of those different ways of engaging um, the landscape uh, while we're on site. And that's mo really exciting to me is when I can bring students to the places I actually work in. And that's fun. And it seemed like in your, your article, <laughs> Rivers Run Through It, that Greek heroic figures, I guess maybe is the term to use, or legendary figures, whichever, were constantly at war, not just with each other, but with their surroundings. It seemed like that was kind of the, one of the themes to take away from that. And I was, that was in the back of my mind recently, as I had Netflix's sort of documentary about part of Alexander the Great's life on in the background. Mm -hmm. And I also had 
gone down to see my parents recently and was playing a podcast version of an audio book about Alexander the Great from 18, written in like 1850 or something. But one of the, one of the things that had come up was, uh, and, and I usually discount this because I think it's biased history written by the, the winners, but after reading your article, I think there might be some more truth to it, which is the Greeks had the, the Greeks in antiquity had a very rough natural landscape that they were also doing battle with and may have in some ways influenced their military tactics and their ability to, for a brief period of time, conquer what you would say was the known world. I mean, is that kind of a way to look at it, how it also plays into the military and conquest side of things? Yeah, it's really interesting. This is um, something I'm just working on now. I'm writing a... um a chapter for a brand new history of the classical and archaic worlds of Greece. And um, what's nice about this new history is it's gonna bring in environmental pieces as well. And so I, I'm writing the chapter on rivers, which is such a great honor. I'm so glad to be writing this chapter. But one thing I'm looking at is how rivers play into army tactics. Um, rivers are, of course, if you're marching um, thousands of miles away from your homeland you with tens of thousands of men, you need to know you're going to have water and food. And there are great passages in Herodotus and Thucydides where we hear of these armies drinking rivers dry because there's so many of them. And certainly the Greek landscape is not known for its abundant rivers. There's very few like James River like entities in Greece. Um, so it, they're mainly seasonal streams and um, mid-sized rivers. So an army on campaign, they would use rivers or boundaries they have to get across. They're often boundaries set between enemies and enemy combatants they'd stay on one side of the river or the other it's needed for sustenance they can also use it to fight we have examples of uh, water will come out of springs and then flow down into sinkholes as it passes through a valley we have the same thing that goes on here in um, southwestern virginia we have a karstic landscape which is limestone and so water percolates down through it so armies knew how to clog up those outlets and flood an opponent out and so armies on campaign had to know about the land they passed through. Um, we know about, I mean, not do, dealing with rivers, but we know about other armies poisoning honey supplies so that bees were feeding on flowers that caused the honey to be poisonous. And then that was toxic to their enemies. So understanding the land they were passing through was part of the weapon, part of the strategies that military armies uh, used, which is really fascinating. So it's not surprising to see these great heroes like Heracles and Achilles actually fighting the land or fighting monsters that can be um, metaphors for these landscapes in some ways. And to go on a little bit of a side quest here, which is a reference for my son, if he listens, probably won't. But <laughs> the I was thinking about how the land and the natural formations that you encounter will impact your military tactics. The Romans drop the phalanx in favor of the maniple system as a result of the hill country. And mm -hmm. the, some, I can't remember which Samnite war, but it was one of the Samnite wars. And you mentioned limestone, which I have a very strong dislike for, if my memory <laughs> serves correctly, because of the sinkholes that are associated with that. Mm -hmm. We had one at our old house just up the street in our neighbor's yard. And it was a night. I mean, it was his yard, but we had half of our driveway blocked off and we had people from the city coming out. And like, I'd get home late at night and it's February and I can't, I'm, how do you want me to get to my house people? Like what, what do you want me to do anyway? So not a fan of naturally occurring limestone formations because of that. Yeah. Again, two side quests. I apologize. No, it's, it's <sighs> interesting that um, this very landscape that the Greeks struggled with 
And it becomes a metaphor for a lot of monsters in their own um, mythologies we struggle with in this part of the country. Um, I've been dying to go to, I'll give a shout out to uh, a woman who lives on the property of Murder Hole out here in Badata County. She's been giving lectures about this cave, which has a lot of mythology and stories associated with it out here on in Badatat. And it's a huge cave. And um, so I want to go to her lecture and hear about the stories associated with a local limestone um, outcropping. <clears throat> Let me track off a little bit into something else here uh, at the request of my daughter. And I will full confession, I am not particularly well schooled in Greek history. And by particularly, I mean hardly at all. So my memory is having to read uh okay, oh I can't remember the name of the author, but it was some part of a book in like ninth grade maybe about Greek mythology. And I felt like a lot of the Greek history was kind of forced down our throat. And this is going to surprise my wife when I say this, I have a little bit of a contrarian streak in me. So I didn't really pick a lot of it up. Uh, my kids, however, have, and my daughter is a huge, huge fan of Athena. So I have to ask about this or I will get yelled at by her, which I don't want to do. So if you could, <laughs> if you could just tell us a little bit about Athena, who she was, kind of what her role was and what how she influenced uh, Greek mythology. Well, Athena is um, comes from a long line historically from the Near East and Egypt and other places of these strong warrior goddesses who become emblems of certain cities' strengths and protections. And of course, Athena becomes associated with her eponymous city, Athens in particular, but her cult and her worship is spread all over Greece. And I'm fascinated by this sort of bifurcation of women in actuality and women in mythology, in particular goddesses, and how um, that type of autonomy and strength and individuality that Athena has as a goddess is not necessarily what women would have had in the cities there. And so then how do you interpret this goddess Athena? Well, she is born from Zeus's head um, uh, after he has an affair with the goddess Metis, whose name is Wisdom. So embodied in Athena is this I idea of um, cunning and intelligence. And she's born fully armed you know she's born with a helmet a shield and a spear so she's ready to be a warrior goddess when she is born but what she really more becomes is a protector of the traditional ways of life in a city both for the young men and the young women for she is connected with um sort of advising and helping great heroes in Greek mythology. She's associated with Achilles. She's associated with Odysseus. But she's also associated with weaving and crafts and craftsmanship that the women of the city do. So one of her best preserved temples in Athens, we have the Parthenon, but we have another temple um, down in the marketplace of Athens, which is dedicated to Hephaestus and Athena. And it's Athena Hephaestia, Athena who is in charge of handicrafts and handiworks. And she helps the women who actually weave the dress that she wears on her cult statue up on the big rock the Acropolis of Athens, where her main temple, the Parthenon, is associated. So she's she's got a lot of things going on with her. And there's a lot of different ways that she's worshipped all across the um, 
Greek world. She has different kinds of connections, uh, cult connections and all sorts of different places. In Sparta, she's connected with bronze working in some way. Um, so there are a lot of different associations that she takes on. But of course, we see her as a warrior goddess. Um, she is one of the three who fight off the giants who were a great threat to the cosmic order. Um, they were born from drops of blood from Uranus when they fell on Gaia Earth. And they sprang up and they were challenging the Olympian gods. And she and Zeus and Heracles were the ones who really um, put them in their place. Although all the gods uh, did the fighting, Athena really uh, came to the fore there. And that's what's celebrated in Athens in their great festivals, is Athena fighting against these giants and actually preserving the universe to be what it is for the uh, Athenians. So in many ways, she serves a socio-cultural sort of purpose in keeping the status quo, men fighting, women doing the handiwork. Um, and as a virgin goddess, she doesn't have to get involved in that whole business of having children and things like that. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Well, she also had an owl associated with her. Is that right? Yeah. And that sort of comes into the idea of wisdom, you know, that owls are sort of a symbol of wisdom as well. And so um, the beautiful coins of Athens called the drachmas uh, have a great depiction of an owl on it and then a head of Athena on the other side. It's um, it's just a beautiful depiction so, yes, yeah, she's often depicted with the owl. And those of you who listen who are fans of Star Wars will recognize this because Ahsoka, one of my daughter's other favorite characters, also has an owl associated with her. So it reverberates today, yet another side quest. But it ties in nicely. So we're going to keep that as a smooth transition. It was interesting what you were talking about regarding her dual role of sort of a fierce warrior, but also a traditional example of, of uh, this really sounds awful when I say this, but a, a, a normalized, expected traditional role for women in society. And I was reading your article about graves, grave markers in the ancient world. And I, I came across one on uh, page 260 that I found very interesting. Uh, and it it reads, uh, in part, I lie in this barren land, soulless, having left behind two young children and a spouse, having fixed a great reputation among the living for domestic accomplishments. Greetings. A spotless house eternally remains, both for marvelous care and on account of my pious character. And I read that and I said to myself, that's not that different from when men are talking about women and one of the first things they say about them is great cook or great chef or whatever. And it just kind of hit me that it's been a long time, but maybe not too much has changed over, over these centuries. Uh, and uh, I will confess to being guilty of that myself. However, uh, no one comes out of the spotless. However, I'm just curious However, is probably the wrong word. How did you end up studying these ancient grave markers? And and, and part of the reason I'm asking is my uh, my mom's parents are uh, were big genealogy buffs. Uh, grandpa still I don't know how much research he still does on that, but it's always been one area that's been constant in my life through through my grandmother and grandfather. I'm just curious how you ended up studying that area as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a twofold reason why that happened. One was a colleague of mine at Holland's, Kathy Nolan in the art history department, was putting together a symposium at the college and she wanted me to participate. And she said it's going to, she worked on um, the burial tombs of uh, queens in medieval France. And so she, um, 
she wanted me to do something on women in burial. And I was like, well, that's not really what I do, but okay. And so I ended up studying another monument of Frosaclea from the archaic period that has a really great inscription going with it. And that ties into my theme of wanting to combine art history elements and original texts. And so I became interested in women and burial, especially because at the same time, my husband and I lost like six family members. All of our elders died like within two years. And so, you know, the idea of commemoration and how do you commemorate people? How do people live on through grave markers you put up or through stories you tell about them just became interesting to me. And then I realized that a lot of ordinary women you know, they don't get talked about in the great historian. They don't get mentioned in decrees, but they do have burial markers. And what I found is that outside of Athens, some of them actually got burial markers with long, original, poetic epithets. And I was interested in these sort of local poets sitting near a graveyard, cranking out poems as a job for these grave monuments and what did these epithets tell us because a lot of the grave monuments will be formulaic and so they'll you know a uh, great it takes a long time to sculpt something so i think that sculptors who work on grave monuments always have like do you want a you know a woman sitting on a chair do you want a woman shaking the hand of her husband do you want a woman lying on a bed what do you want i got those you know and then they fill in the details later because they can't do it all on the spot and then the poetry the epitaph is what personalizes it and brings out the details of this woman's life. So that I became intrigued with. I was teaching courses on women in the ancient world, and I wanted to talk more about, you know, ordinary women. What do we know about their these lives? And basically these, um, especially Hellenistic, that is dated to about post fourth century to about first century BCE, those monuments have <clears throat> really expressive poetry and really tell some fabulous stories about these women. Um, I like the story, the Isaias uh, epithet you mentioned, because, you know, her her tombstone shows her like, you know, with a kid and she's got um, a wool basket under her bench and she looks fairly engaged and it contrasts with the sadness of her final resting place, just in a barren graveyard, which is very sad. So, um, so that's how I got interested in that. <clears throat> well, there's one thing that I want to come back to on that one, because there were so many references that you made to women who had died in childbirth. And I want to ask you some more questions about that. But you were mentioning markers and how you try to remember people and learning more about ordinary women. My grandfather actually traced his, his, well, our, we can trace our family back further through some lines, but he traced his line back through the Wayne name back to about 1492, maybe. Wow. And hmm. he wrote, he's an engineer. So he's very, he, he's going to find a way to make, it as precise as possible but but he he wrote a book about it uh, that the family and family members have copies of and i want to read part of it to you because you were talking about ordinary women i can just hear my wife laughing as i read this the structure is as a patriarchy i think this was written in the 80s maybe 70s or 80s the structure is as a patriarchy because that is the way our society has been organized the matriarchal lineage will be covered in subsequent works. The lack of information about the female component of each generation is regrettable. It results because of the general lack of information of that member of society in our historical record. It can be fairly assumed that the participation of women in the past was much as it is today. And then he goes on from there for the lines, and he can't find the wife, mother for one, two, three, four, five, six out of seven people that he has referenced back 
going back to 1492 up until about 1620 uh, and thereabouts. And then after that, it gets more common. But it, it's interesting how long those problems persist for and have gone on uh, throughout time. But t- talk a little bit about, if you can, the – and actually, I think that – I don't know when the term patriarchy was coined for the way that it's used today, but I'm going to give my grandfather credit for that. I'm going to give him the first note for that in my mind. And if it's not true, I don't care. Uh, but <laughs> uh, if uh, if you can – what, it, it almost seemed like the the deaths in childbirth was presented as a heroic thing or it's an okay thing. This happens and we're going to honor you and remember you. Can, you. can you give us some theories or ideas as to how it came about that way and why it came about that way? Yeah, I think that there was, I mean, I, I know that there was a definite connection between what women did in childbirth was akin to what men did in warfare. Um, they struggled. It was a trial. It was like fighting against a really hard, difficult force. And the results could be either you survived or you didn't. And in fact, Medea in Euripides's play about Medea, I don't know if any of your readers might know about Medea. Medea was um, a foreign queen that a Greek hero, Jason, brings back from the Black Sea area. She helps him with some magic and to help him overcome some difficulties. And he brings her back to Corinth and they have two kids and she repudiate, he repudiates her because he realizes he can't be a Greek king if he's married to a foreign woman. So he marries a good foreign woman, a good Greek woman. Medea is understandably pissed off and she does talk about the lot of women that we go through childbirth like they go through warfare. And she has these two children. <clears throat> and she realizes, unfortunately, and sadly, and rather awfully, that the way to get back at him is to murder their children. And that's what she does. It's horrible. But she does equate this idea of childbirth and warfare. And um, the poem that's written for Hediste that I write about in my article from um, Demetrius Pagasai, there's a lot of Homeric language used in that poem. And I think whoever wrote that, a local Thessalian poet, I mean, I'm really interested in these anonymous poets who get some publication cred by putting their poems on tombstones, um, that you know, it really equates what she did to a a, a struggle with warfare. This was her fate to die in childbirth. Unfortunately, it seems like the child might have died as well. That's a little unclear, uh, but um, certainly she dies in childbirth. And she's laid out, the painting of her is really quite heroic. She's laid out uh, looking very noble with an aggrieved father and grandmother right next to her. And there are a handful of tombstones that show women dying in childbirth. This must have been very common. And um, so that we have, you know, as many as we do in the material record, there's probably more that we've lost. Um, But this must have been one of the ways that women at a very young age, you know, died. I. Okay. So I, I'm, I could not imagine a more frightening thing than needing medical care for a serious issue in antiquity, mm-hmm. be it you're injured on the battlefield or you're giving birth. I mean, I just, that could not have been, remotely close to being reassuring or anyway we we could go go on for a long time about that but (laughs) sometimes when i do these i I have a hard time putting certain things into words other than wow scary and that's that's where i would come down on that one i'll just i'll just comment on that that um interestingly enough even though it must have been challenging in terms of equipment, knowledge, medication, 
uh, pain management, sanitation, all of those things. You know, recent studies looking at ancient bones make us realize that they survived a lot more stuff than we would have ever imagined. You know, like, you know, now they study skeletons so carefully for injuries um, and they can tell a lot of things from the bones about what kinds of diseases they had. Um, and it's amazing what people actually survived using, you know, herbs, local knowledge, bandages, um, sheer persi persistence. Uh, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> Ooh, man. Well, <clears throat> it, yeah, I still though, man, I would not want to be, I would not want to have to have a family member given birth back then. That would, that would no. be frightening. Uh, no, oh. no. Uh, goodness. Uh, well, let's, a uh, couple other areas that I wanted to to cover with you. And it, it goes back to kind of religion, Greek religion itself. And, and let me give you kind of a background on what very little I know about Greek religion, other than like a scattered <clears throat> bits and pieces of Greek mythology, is my primary exposure to it has been through when Rome comes in. And it's like, hey, what's up, guys? We're taking this. This is ours now. And you see kind of a melding culturally of Greek influence into the Roman empire. And there's a lot of these kind of mystery cults that crop up mm -hmm. and I'm trying to be nice about this. Cause I don't know much about it, but a lot of it sounded from a distance, a little scammy, a little good way to make <laughs> a living like, Oh, we'll come pay us a certain amount of money and you can learn all about these mystery cults. And I'm sure there was a lot more to it than that. And I just haven't delved into it, but it, from a from a distance, it seemed a little scammy, but I'm just curious. Could could you talk about a little bit in regard to could you could you go over a little bit about Greek religious practices and kind of how the Greeks of antiquity would worship gods and goddesses? Well, that of course is a gigantic topic, and it's hard to be talk generally about it, but. I'll see what I can do. Um, <clears throat> certainly, Greece was a polytheistic society. Um, they did not believe in just one god, but they believed in many gods that had um, control over different aspects of life. Um, Zeus, weather, and um, <clears throat> things in the sky, Poseidon, things in the sea, Athena, things having to do with the state and with warfare, Hera, things having to do with the home and childbirth. And, and there were lots of even smaller divinities like nymphs and river gods and other gods that were worshipped probably in ways that we don't even know how they were worshipped because uh, material doesn't survive for us. That was very personal stuff. So in, in many ways, there were, were tiers of religious practice. There was state cult, which belonged to the city and the state. And those are the priests that probably made a fairly good living. Um, <clears throat> any sacrifices of animals that were given, they got a good portion of the meat. They probably had fairly good lives they led. They tended a cult statue, made sure it was, um, you know, tended to, hearth fires held to, protected, things like that. But these state cults were, interestingly enough, also a way to get, and this is going to sound really flippant, to get protein into the general population. You figure... An animal like a cow or a goat or a lamb, um, these things, yes, could be milked and that would be used. But in terms of killing them for the meat, this was not something that an ordinary citizen would do just to have a hamburger every day like we do in America. So these big festivals when a huge, like 500 or 100 oxen were slaughtered, this was a way for 
people to partake in infusions of protein and they would get some of that meat and the bones and the fat would go up to the god but then the other meat would be cooked and served for the local population also there wasn't preservation of meat so these sacrifices were a way to distribute meat to a a, a large body of people but then not all sacrifices were meat based for the gods there were also um, smaller sacrifices just of objects small terracotta figurines nuts seeds first fruits um, Demeter, who is our goddess of grain and is one of the recipients of these mystery cults that you talk about, she just got um, grain as an offering. And that mystery cult, it's hard to, yeah, it it was a huge outlay and expense to participate. And you had to buy certain stuff to be part of it, certain clothing, certain animals, you know, you had to have a tent to stay in, all sorts of things. So these things would be expensive to participate in. And of course, we don't really know what people got out of it in the long run. They were part of a special club. We don't know what epiphany they had because these mystery cults you couldn't talk about. But I guess what I'm trying to drive out here, and I haven't said it over outright, is that social participation in a community and religion were one and the same that this was what it's still in many ways the way it is in Greece today there's still a lot of religious practices your name day your name is a saint so <clears throat> that's how you celebrate celebrating your birthday in modern day Greece is not as important as celebrating your name day they have a series of saints days where there are panagiri, and it always delights me because there are whole rows of souvlaki stands where you're buying meat on spits. And how is this any different than what they did in antiquity? Um, so, but religion was very much entwined in how you live together in a community. And um so there were rites of passage for young men and young women, um, divinities to pray to. If you were not getting pregnant and you were worried about that, you could go and drink special water. If you were ill, you would sleep in the temple of Asclepius and get a dream about what might heal you. So all of these things, were, they were just part and parcel of daily life. And I think we can't even imagine what it was like. I see it a little bit in Greece. Like when you, if you're Greek Orthodox and you walk through a neighborhood, you know, you cross yourself when you pass the church and you might even stop in and kiss the icon and then go on your way. Um, so in a way I see it embedded in modern day Greek life in, in a smaller way than it would have been in ancient life. Um, but it was certainly it was also the way that people were employed. I mean, think about all of these big temples that were built. This was a way for the state to, su uh, to support quarry workers, stone cutters, woodworkers, carvers, artisans, painters. Um, it was a way to take that money from the state and distribute it among the people so that they could live. So it's a much different system of religion in terms of spiritual belief or a spiritual awakening, the way we think about it today. There was probably some of that, but I think it was more of a social practice. A couple of things that you mentioned there, as far as what people got out of the cults, I think it was the, I'm going to mispronounce it, Elysian mystery cult was big mm -hmm. and emperor Hadrian got a lot out of that. He was the, the Greek lean, I think was what he was probably somewhat derisively yeah. referred to as when he was emperor of Rome. But you also said the name day. It's funny that you, you brought that up. I was reading Zorba the Greek. I just finished that a couple of weeks oh. ago. And that, well, the, you mentioned the language barrier, the storytelling and the narrative structure was different from a lot of what I'm, I'm used to. It was very, very somewhat atypical 
But when Zorba mentions his name day, I said, what, what in the world is that? And I, I looked and I said, okay, I got it. I got it. So it's interesting that, 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 that that's still a big deal. But w- one other thing that I wanted to, to talk to you about, uh, your article about the Hydra, I found pretty interesting. Can you kind of give us your, your big overview of that and how you ended up writing that article? Yeah, that springs from my dissertation. Um, I did, I, I'm a member of now, I was a member of then, I did their uh, year-long program of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. Every country that wants to do archaeological work or cultural study in Greece has to have a school from which you apply for permit. And our school in Athens was um, founded back in, I'm just trying to remember, I should know when it was founded. Here we go, 1881. And it's one of the earliest cultural schools in Athens. And they have a program for graduate students where you go for a whole year and you travel. It's basically boot camp for classicists. You travel to, I mean, I'm not kidding, like, 300 archaeological sites, 100 museums, you go to lectures, you meet with all these great scholars, and you just learn everything there is to know about classical antiquity. It is fabulous. It changed my life. So that year, I was determined to come and find my dissertation topic. I did not know what I wanted to write on. And we came across Heracles and some cult installations for the hero Heracles, otherwise known as Hercules in the Roman world, in a lot of different sites. And people did reports on them. And I was like, but what was the cult about? What was the cult? And there was nothing written about it. So I decided to write my thesis on the cult of Heracles. And I limited it to a part of Greece called the Peloponnesus, the southern part of Greece. And I started by looking at, you know, Heracles' famous 12 labors. So I looked at, he did six of them in the Peloponnesus. So I looked at the six labors he did in the Peloponnesus. And we had gone to all of those places when we did this year-long program. And I realized all of those places had Bronze Age, that is very early, 3000 BCE, installations that controlled water dams canals channels and i thought what if these myths were commemorating a uh, age old technology that the bronze age people developed to clear swampland from these areas and create an area that was suitable for agriculture. Now, in some places, this was more obvious in the archaeological record than others. And one of them is at Lerna. There are some where Heracles fought the Hydra. The Hydra is a monster from antiquity that has anywhere from three to a thousand heads, depending on who you read in literature. And those heads are snaky. And she lives in a swamp. And she's stinky and noxious. And one of the things that's difficult about fighting her is you cut off one of her heads and two more will grow back. And in reading all of the literature that describes this labor of Heracles, I realized that this could be a description of what it's like to control the many, the multiple water sources in a swamp. If you block up one passageway in, two other things spring out at the side and still fill the swamp. And so Heracles solved this problem by cauterizing the heads of the Lernian Hydra. And and then the, you know, dried her up and then reclaimed the land for agriculture. And lo and behold, there have been great geomorphological studies of this plain where Lerna is located. And there's lots of different rivers. There are springs with named nymphs associated with them. 
And controlling the water sources through there has been a problem throughout time. Even up into the modern period, the roadway will still flood and become muddy and kind of noxious looking. Um, but they've done some coring down into the swamp and they can actually determine that there were times when the water passage was controlled by looking at that coring. And so I discovered that these tales were probably encoded stories, mythologies that told a story about a great technological exploit done by hydraulic engineers in the Mycenaean period. And you don't want to talk about them, you know, building walls and stuff like this. So they make it a story about conquering a monster. And I discovered that this was the case for the Nemean lion, for the Aramanthian boar, for the <clears throat> Carinian hind. All of these had some watery areas associated with them where the control of water the hydraulic engineering is what Heracles did and then there are other there are really great stories that talk about Heracles as digging ditches and being in control of um rechanneling waters the Augean stables is a labor he does in the Peloponnesus where he's told he has to clear the dung out of a stable you know, in a day, and it's just years and years and years of accumulation of dung from these animals, and he diverts the course of a river through the stable, washes it clean, diverts the river back. So he's a great hydraulic engineer. And so in trying to discover who he was in his cult aspect, which I did find interesting, very clear designations that he has there, that's how I discovered this connection with um, with the landscape, that these myths were set in very specific types of areas where there were remains of Mycenaean dams. And that's the Bronze Age term for, that's the term for the Bronze Age civilization, the, My, the Mycenaeans, which um, many of you would have, will have heard about. So when I was reading your articles and listening to what you'd said just now, it's sort of, I, I guess, a way to think about the Greek mythologies is one of probably two ways that fit together real well is if these are engineering feats, they're a little bit boring to tell. So maybe someone's grandfather to pick at their grandchild added a layer of entertainment to it, mm -hmm. which is not at all a reference of what, uh, my grandfather used to do to us, but anyway, we'll leave that aside. But but also in many ways, it's, it's sort of telling this is how our civilization came to be. This is how we got to where we are. This is what we had to do. And then mm -hmm. over time, the story expands from what it maybe was initially to what it became, which reminds me a little bit of kind of the Irish legend of Cúchulainn and because of the landscape there, maybe it was possible for one guy to defend a lot of things, but I guess maybe seven or eight people get merged into this one concept of Heracles. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think that's really true that, um, that a lot of great humans who did wonderful things for their community they th what they did gets absorbed into this figurehead of Heracles and um and then gets worshipped or the tales get told. But what I've often found interesting about myths is that often little details will change, but often not where they took place. So the place will always stay the same, and some of the natural features of that place, the mountain, the river, the sea, the plain, the rock in a certain area. And so what I often feel is that these myths were often put together to map the world. This is a map. It was a verbal oral map transmitted as people went to other places. 
they could tell these stories of this land of Lerna or this land of the Odean stables. Um, here's a tale about it, of what happened there. And, and then it maps that world for other, for foreigners, for other people. And it travels. That's an interesting way to look at it as the myths are sort of a cartographer's work. I, I like that. That's a, that's a good way to think of it as, as a way to map, map the ancient world. Well, this has been uh, very fascinating, very heavy stuff on a Sunday morning, <laughs> much less stressful than teaching the boy how to drive. So uh, <laughs> a couple other topics I wanted to cover with you just briefly. What are some good introductory sources for Greek mythology for people who are in my listeners' uh, age bracket, or not age bracket, but life bracket, meaning no longer in college and looking to read something in their free time? Okay. Um, you know, one thing that's actually really kind of enjoyable and really sticks to the facts of things is Stephen Fry, the British comedian, he has actually written a series of books on Greek myth, and it reimagines them, but it's it's very easy to read, and you learn a lot about these myths. It's sort of like a good primer, and what I like about his books is that he'll have sources at the end, so like if there's a tale that you become really interested in, you can go back and read the some original ancient texts about it so i really his i have his one book right here at my desk mythos is um mythos is one of them and it's it's actually kind of enjoyable i would also highly recommend just reading the iliad and the odyssey um there are th there are great new translations out of these works now that make them much more readable and i would recommend in particular emily wilson who has just completed her really masterful translation of Homer's Iliad. She also did a translation of the Odyssey that makes it readable for, uh, you know, a, a person today. It's modernized language. It's quick paced um, uh, poetry. It is written in meter. It's written in iambic trimeter, but it reads very easily and nicely. And then, you know, an, a book really from antiquity to, for people to read, if you want a compendium of all the myths, read Ovid's Metamorphoses. And there's a fairly good translation out by Stanley Lombardo um, that is that makes it very enjoyable. In some ways, I just recommend people go back to you know, the original sources, but in good readable translations. What people often suffer from is they pick up a translation and there's all these these and thous and awkward language and ugh, toss those aside, get a good translation and just read the sources. They're what fun. They're, they're really the fun part. There's also a good, there's a site out there called theoi.com, which has images and has um it's by aaron atzma um and it has really it's it's pretty good it's got some it's got the original ancient sources but often since it's on the internet it's those weird old translations which are kind of awkward but he brings together a lot of really good material and it's kind of fun to look at and it's reliable you know it isn't crap it's really reliable wikipedia can sometimes be crap so we <laughs> have to be careful if you could send me that website so I can include that in my post on this, that would be very helpful. Uh, and I'm glad that you mentioned Ovid because it goes back to Roman history and the start of the Augustan era, which I think we're going to have an episode about him. And I'm just going to kind of give away the goat a little bit on this. I always thought Augustus was kind of a brat when he started <laughs> out. I'm just going to go ahead and put that on the record. Just, just kind of a little bit of a brat. But anyway, we'll we'll deal with that a little bit more down the line. This has been a, a very interesting conversation, and I do want to give you what I give every guest who comes on, which is an open mic, to talk about an important topic. 
So you have answered a lot of my questions. It is only fair that I give you some time to discuss something uh, that you find important. So the floor is yours. Oh, um, yeah. Well, I think the one thing that I might want to talk about as being really important is to learn ancient languages and to read or any language and to read some of this material in the original. It may seem really daunting, um, but there is nothing like getting a real touch with the past than by reading words that they actually chose and wrote down and organized in the way that they do. And learning a language, whether it be an ancient language or a modern language, reshapes your brain. You will think differently after you learn a language. Um, I remember that my first conversation that I had in modern Greek um, as a student with a woman who worked in the kitchen at the school I went to, it was amazing. I just thought, we she cannot speak to me in English. I cannot speak to her in English. This is how we have to connect with this with these other grammatical structures, with these words. And words are important. And so knowing what words they used and the range of meanings those words might have had is just so important. And it just is a great way to expand your mind is by learning language and uh, honoring the languages of others. And let's not let them die. Um, you know, Greek and Latin, are not dead languages. They are very much alive in the way we think about the world today. So go back and investigate that. Um, that's the most important thing to me is language, learning language. And depending on where you are in your life, it can be a great way to meet your future spouse, which is where I met my wife, which was in a German class. And <laughs> Actually, it was her first college class. I was a little behind in my German. I it, Long story, but I didn't need as many credits in high school to graduate uh, the year that I graduated as then she required to graduate the following year. So it can pay off. You got to have a long game on that one. Take a little <laughs> bit of a different view. Well, uh, doctor, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. I hope we can do this again sometime. And then for future planning purposes, for everybody who is listening, there are going to be a few more antiquity themed episodes, including one, which I think is outside of the technical definition of classical antiquity, but I have a theory about why it ought to be included within that time period. We're going to learn about an empire that never existed called the Byzantine empire. I'll explain. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll explain that later. There's a very discreet period of time in it that we're going to talk about, but we're going to learn about this. Speaking of myths, mythological empire, the Byzantine empire that really wasn't a Byzantine empire. We'll save that for April when we get there. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, working on an episode about Alexander the Great, which may happen a little bit sooner. And we can talk about whether using terms like great are the best terminology because i just read uh, that audio book that i listened to basically just said this dude was just basically a robber but that's what you did back then because really he just was like i'm just gonna go out and start a war with these people i got nothing to do here it's hot it's boring there aren't a whole lot of other outlets for me so i'm leaving anyway we'll talk about that concept later i, I had never really thought about it that way before but that was the book from 1850 that or so that i mentioned earlier so we got some episodes that we're working on we are going to have an acc themed episode conference is still around for now it still exists we will discuss it and see what its future might hold and then i'm sure there will be some fascinating mythology we can work up about jim phillips and his handling <laughs> of the mess that we're in in the ACC right now. But that is what it is. So we're dealing with that. Follow us on our website, bullcitycoordinators.com. Thank you for listening to the Classical Antiquity Podcast brought to you by Bull City Coordinators. And as always, go Duke. And it's times like this, I wish I knew another language because I could say something interesting in Latin to throw on at the end, but I don't. 
So I will not. We'll just close with go Duke. And then I'll think about some other awesome historical phrase that we can add on to the classical antiquity episodes. Thank you all for listening. And we will see you back here soon. Again, go Duke. <laughs>